This is Heart Rhythm TV. I'm Kamala, and I'm joined by Janet and Ilyani, my wonderful colleagues. Hello, ladies. How are you today? Great. It's good to see you guys again. Just saw you a couple days ago. Nice I to know. see you. Nice to see you. It's good to see each other again. Back to the virtual side. <laughs> I, know. <laughs> I know. Back from face to face to virtual, right? Exactly. Absolutely. So we are here today to wrap, give an overview and wrap up of ACC 2022 that was held in Washington, D.C. And I'm going to call on Ilyani. What yeah. did you think of the Pacific uh, AF trial? Just give us some overview and highlights. Yeah, so for me, it was very uh, interesting to see that data. It's a phase two trial uh, that it compared one of the uh, in inhibitors of factor 11A. Normally, just to give a little bit of background, uh, the, the anticoagulation, the oral anticoagulation therapy that we use are inhibitor factor 10. So this is kind of a new idea uh, to see if we can actually produce less risk of bleeding with the same amount of prevention of thrombosis. So this was a phase two trial, it was a randomized multi-center blind study, uh, pretty well done uh, that compare uh, with against uh, Pixavan, that is uh, the gold standard and, and have uh, shown a really good uh, uh, data in, in the past. So actually this produced less amount of bleeding in these patients compared to a Pixavan, which is very promising. Uh, and and at the same time, uh, uh, preventing uh, thrombosis uh, uh, and a stroke uh, and composite endpoint. This is just a phase two trial, but it's very promising. Uh, good data to start with. I love the idea of exploring new uh, medications, right? So we can have more resources. Uh, and, and it's interesting, the mechanism. Apparently, it's postulated that it can uh, block the thrombosis without increase the, the bleeding. So let's see what the phase three trials will show. But I, I just love this study. Uh, very well done, uh, interesting data, and, and I'm looking forward for the next study to see the outcomes data. I agree. It was a super exciting trial, so can't wait for the results. And uh, Janet, what do you think of the MAFA 2? Yeah, so MAFA 2 was uh, presented virtually by Dr. Uh, Itao uh, Guo, who we know is from the Huawei Heart Study. Um, she's been the lead author uh, woman um, in digital health, which I always love. Uh, so this was actually the consumer-led portion of the MAFA 2 trial. And it was really interesting because they really rolled out this MAFA 2 in like a pre-MAFA and then like the actual MAFA trial. And they got people to download freely this app uh, on their smartphones and on their watches or their wearables. And they actually got about over 3 million people to do this. So it's huge numbers, right? Huawei is known for huge numbers. And so they sort of whittled that down to once they found AFib in these patients, they found the irregular notification happened in about 0.4 of that um, percent of that population, which is about 12,000 patients or so. And then that sort of whittled down to about 5,000 patients that actually sort of followed up uh, thereafter, right? So of those 5,000, what's important to understand is that when they looked at those 5,000 patients, almost 94% of those patients actually had a fib on a concomitant EKG. So it was pretty good as far as validation was, as far as looking at that app, that PPG app. Now, what they also found that was important was that the amount of AFib that they found over the three years that they studied these patients increased over time, which would be expected, right? The longer you follow someone, the longer or the more AFib you'll probably likely find. The other interesting part though, is that their um, average age was 37, right? So this is a very young population, very, very young, not our usual 65 and above. And then the last thing they found was that um, they did find that there's about 33% or 30% um, of their population also had OSA. And so when you had OSA and you had an ap apnea hypopnea index that was greater than 30, that led to about 1.5 times higher detection of AFib in that population. So overall, it was a great trial, I thought. Huge numbers again. Um, but I think comparing that with, you know, the other trials that have come out, we still need sort of outcomes data about like, what are we going to do with all this data that we find, right? So stroke stop showed a little bit of a significant, um, you know, primary endpoint of, of, uh, of treating um, lower, I'm sorry, lower um, MACE in um, patients who were screened and treated. Um, but loop 
didn't really show that. So I think the jury is sort of still out. Agree, agree. Yeah, so the third trial I thought was interesting was the Partita trial. You know, this trial basically looked at the timing of ablation for VT uh, in patients with devices who received the first shock. Should we ablate the VT earlier or should we wait for more time and uh, give antiarrhythmics, et cetera, before ablating? And uh, it's a multi-center prospective. And they, the trial was done in two phases. Phase A, the, they looked at specific uh, patients, a uh, total of 517 patients were followed up and they pulled up the data over nine years. 16 European centers enrolled uh, these patients. Out of those, only 66 patients had shocks for VT. And that makes us think like, uh, you know, they used the made it rich programming with delayed detection and a lot of ATP use. And in the phase B, out of those 66 patients, um, you know, they had 50 56 patients that they enrolled and it was a one-to-one -one, um, randomization and uh, one group is VT ablation right after the shock, the first shock. Second group uh, received uh, the traditional way, waiting for more shocks and waiting for the antiarrhythmic medications to fail before taking them to the lab for ablation and that was two and a half year follow-up. Bottom line is um, you know, there was a mortality benefit with earlier ablation, reduced hospitalization uh, for heart failure. So that was excellent. And the take home points from here are probably um, advocating from homogeneous uh, programming, especially using the mated RIT. Uh, very delayed detections. Um, and then other thing obviously is uh, first shock, take them to the lab rather than wait um, and another point I'll make there, you know, the ablation was done basically substrate modification instead of uh, putting patients in VT like the good old days. Another interesting thing, um, ladies, is that repeated ATPs actually led to 4% increased risk in shock. So that makes us ponder and say, when we program too much ATP, are we putting these patients into you know, a more shock, shock rate? And so it's very important to have, I guess, critical ATP programming and uh, using mid-grid programming across the board. So that's the overview of that. All right, Eliani. Um, I like Kamala that approach because they actually, just to comment on that, they standardize the approach because, yes. you know, VT ablations, we all thinking, you know, we're going to induce the VT, what are we going to ablate, are we going to do channels, are we going to do, so they actually did it in sinus rhythm, which actually right. makes us more a standardized approach, so we all kind of do the same, uh, and, and, and great outcomes, actually, that they promised. Yeah, us. so they, no, that's very good, yeah, they did substrate modification. And they didn't study. induce VT or anything, so they use the standard potential set. Do you think, Kamala, that the guidelines are going to change a little bit and push? Uh, this is good data. Partita trial is yes. really good data. What are your thoughts about how our guidelines for VT ablation is going to change? I think oh. the guidelines are going to change to saying, you know, maybe they'll become plus one indication, you know, post uh, <laughs> for after first shock. You yeah. know, we're not, you know, different practices, but uh, some centers do that maybe, but just most of the time uh, we wait out, right? Let's wait for a second shock. Let's wait, uh, you know, give antiarrhythmics before we do the ablation. So, um, you know, we'll see change in the guidelines for sure. And we'll also change, uh, see change in uh, hopefully adaptation of homogeneous programming. Exactly. exactly. And Eliani, so yes. let's uh, talk was on. One well, well, one last trial that uh, it was EP related. It was I was pretty impressed by the data of the uh, the infection rate in device. Mm -hmm. Uh, so we're talking about the low rate of application of the guidelines for infected devices in the patient population with endocarditis and documented infection. What did I think about this trial? It was pretty impressive, actually. It was observational, retrospective, but huge amount of data. And, and I was not surprised by the mortality, but I was surprised about uh, how, how little we do for them. <laughs> yeah, I think, you know, when you looked at the patient population that, they, uh, that had infection, they were a pretty high risk 
Exactly. Uh, so, you know, they had lots of comorbidities. Um, there were actually a lot of women in, um, in this trial as well. I think it was 40%, if, uh, correct me if I'm wrong. Um, I think what struck me is, you know, we know that the guidelines give us a class one indication to really do a total extraction of systems that are infected. And so what this trial showed us is that it was really that only, I think, 20% received extraction within, within like the first 30 days. It's pretty low. And then, of course, we find out from this trial is that the mortality was correlated with that quite high mortality, actually. So what do you guys think of that? Yeah, that's not surprising, right? We know that someone with endocarditis, infected least, that the mortality is pretty high. I like the analysis that they did because highlight the problem. I think that this is a wide opening study that is telling us that we need to do more. We need to do more in our perhaps improving referral rate or improving uh, a more sites that do extraction training. Uh, because as, as you mentioned, they not only calculated a pretty high mortality in these patients that are pretty ill, they also calculate the cumulative mortality by extraction time. And they, they mentioned that uh, a 30, one year mortality uh, in patients that did not get extraction in the first 30 days was 32.4%, which is pretty high. And that if you do it earlier, you know, you have a better, uh, a better numbers, but as we know, it's still, you know, the extraction, we need to do more extractions, we need to educate more, we need to, perhaps, this is a good study to highlight the reality, what actually we're doing in the States. No, I like the word, you use the word reality, absolutely. This is one uh, study basically highlights the disconnect between science and uh, practice, uh, clinical practices. So there's a lot of room for education, um, for sure. So this has been a great uh, wrap up. Uh, any other comments, um, Janet or Eliani? Well, I, I think this is wonderful. In three weeks. <laughs> yeah, I was gonna say, we'll see each other in just a few weeks at HRS 2022. Yeah, we're waiting for more stuff to talk, right? And hope to see you soon. Absolutely. And Thank you for joining us uh, today. And uh, for more details on any of these trials, uh, please look at the dialogue box at the bottom of the YouTube channel and we will be posting our links there.